Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> there he is. Paul. Do you remember Jessica? Wow. Biscuit, you know. Oh, Biscuit, don't worry any about Biscuit. Biscuit just cut school again and set fire to the bathroom. Hello? Yeah, John, I, I'm going to have to hang up. There's a... can't skip any more school. When the procession reaches the shore, the priest enters the water and after having begged it to bear the ashes safely away, scatters them on the waves. You mean you, you didn't tell me that you knew something was wrong? Sorry we didn't do it before. That's okay. Then why are you going ahead, going ahead and making all the decisions for me? You can't take me home, man. Hi, Josephine. We'll come back soon. Oh, sorry to startle you. I'm Celeste. I'm one of the social workers here. Can you sign over your accounts to me? Let us handle everything. I don't need your help. Sign this. I think we might have an elder abuse situation. Maybe you could help me. Go back to China! Go back We could contact a state agency and file a report together. No. Josephine, you haven't done anything wrong. I got these in the front. There was nobody here. I was saying hello, hello. If I was a bank robber, I could have done some damage in here. So sorry. Um, are you ready to order? I'll just get the five fish soup, five fish deluxe soup, but no fish, please. The fish that you mentioned here are bottom feeders. They eat poop. It's like, it becomes like a poop soup. I, don't, I, I can't have it. I'm Jennifer BDN. I'm the president of Film Lab. This is Chloe Jenkins. She's the treasurer of the Film Lab. And she's periscoping you live right now. So don't say anything you don't want to hear. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know the Film Lab, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit. We are dedicated to the promotion and support of gender and ethnic diversity in film and television. And we accomplish that in three ways, through education. We run programs every month. We also do outreach and support. So for example, mentorships with all the major networks, ABC, NBC. Um, we run the 72-hour shootout, which is the reason I think several of you are here. And many of you on the live stream, I know, are tuning in virtually because you are shootout competitors. So welcome. 
Um, and the Shootout is an annual filmmaking competition um, celebrating diversity in the arts. And the idea is to get people to empower yourselves, to come out, make your own projects, create your own teams. And then what we give you is exhibition. We give you a platform. We give you mentorships. And we give you the right people to see your stuff. So if you've got the talent, and you can make something amazing happen. Um, and it's you that's making it happen. So, um, and then the final thing we do is production. We create bold, innovative, and deliciously diverse entertainment. Um, right now, we have our online channel, which is AFL TV. You can subscribe for free online. We also have our television series, Film Lab Presents, which is in its seventh season now, which you can watch on Time Warner Cable, Xfinity, Crossings TV, and I think we premiered April 28th. So, yeah, Thursday nights, tune in. And finally, movies. We just started doing films um, celebrating, again, diversity in the arts. Um, so that's kind of us. Tonight is the director's round table. We're thrilled to have these amazing, incredible, fantastic directors with us tonight. And we're going to open it up to questions for all of you. So I think we're going to start with, I'm just going to ask the directors to just briefly introduce themselves, just say a little bit about you. Um, I know one person, maybe a fun fact, I know one person has some surgically enhanced joints that maybe they will tell you about. That's <laughs> 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 first. Erin, do you want to start off? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I have anything surgically enhanced yet, but so there's still hoping. time. There's always hope. <laughs> um, my name is Erin Quill. I'm a screenwriter. I am a director. I direct mainly stage productions, but um, I do have an option to direct something that I wrote, so perhaps that's the natural continuation of that. Um, I wrote the screenplay, or co-wrote the screenplay for the Mikado Project, which did about six or seven film festivals and was shown internationally. I did another film, Cordy, which was contracted to me and is apparently going to be released at some point. Um, and various other things. And uh, as an actor, I was on Broadway in the original company of Avenue Q. I've also worked extensively in casting. I've worked with the networks in uh, their diversity departments and also as part of their showcases. Um, I've kind of worked across the board in entertainment. I The one thing I have not done is waitressed. <laughs> so you can ask me anything about, like I've worked in commercial production, all that kind of stuff. So I think I'm here more for my general knowledge than my specific directing a film, which I have directed stage productions and I do direct stage productions, but film not yet. <laughs> follow that up. It's so easy. <laughs> uh, so my name is Eddie Shea. I am a writer director. Um, let's see. I I started off in uh, in advertising. Actually, I, I still work in advertising. I've worked as an advertising creative director and basically I'm writing commercials and you know we do a lot of hiring the actors and casting and production companies and hiring the directors or photographers and so forth uh, and unlike in film or in television we essentially are the, the ones who just hire a director specifically for their vision uh, once they've shot everything we basically say sayonara see you later thank you very much and we were the ones that are in the editing room actually doing all that stuff uh, until publication or or uh, yeah. um doing this for 20 some odd years and then about 10, I guess, somewhat years ago. Um, I was really bored with the 30 second commercial. Um, so I started uh, just writing and directing um, my own stuff, short films mostly, because uh, I had to develop my endurance to the longer format. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, uh, my first film was like, was okay. You know, it became more commercialized than I wanted to. It was probably a force of habit. My, 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 but I, I did, well, I got uh, uh, sponsored flights to different festivals, you know, you know, internationally and stuff. And after that, I was like, I love this sport. You know, filmmaking is the best. You know, uh, so I've been, you know, doing it since then. And um, uh, I sold my first screenplay in uh, 2010. Uh, got gilded and uh, did a couple of rewrites. Didn't really like it. Um, and uh, I just, just, just this past year, I just got uh, shortlisted a script I wrote uh, to the uh, Sundance Lab and. Uh, screenwriters Live, and, and first one in Europe, actually, in Italy. Uh, and uh, I've also, just last year, was uh, nominated to um, Fox and NBC, and also the O'Neill uh, Directing Fellowships. Uh, they probably didn't get them. Um, and I spent, um, 
a couple months ago, I've been trying to move to TV also, and so I've been, I was very fortunate in that uh, I was able to shadow a show, um, my very first one um, in LA uh, a couple months ago, for, um, which was a great experience, so I'm hoping to do more of that. And I actually just um, would like to get more into theater too, which is, so I directed um, a reading. I used to represent commercial directors, so oh, really? we could totally, yeah, <laughs> totally have a whole thing. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying <laughs> to do commercials. Um, so um, anyways, yeah, so I've been still, you know, pursuing the game and stuff, so. Hi, um, I'm Patrick Wang. I have made uh, two films as writer and director, uh, In the Family and The Grief of Others. I hope to make a third. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, my name is Yan Zheng Kim. I am a performer, I'm director, and I'm a photographer too. And I res um, recently I directed the film The Opposite of the Fairy Tale, wrote by Jennifer Badian. Um, no nepotism here at all. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm pretty much emerging director in the film. Um, I directed mostly in the stage. Um, previous production includes um, Ben, Next Wave, Sweet Sign Suite, and most of them are mixed media as um, I've been mostly working in the downtown theater and some of the short film, and I hope to make more. <laughs> awesome. So I'm gonna start it with just a couple questions, and we had a bunch of people that submitted questions to us online. So we're just gonna start with a few of those, and then we'll open it up, and you guys will get the, the rest to ask any questions you should desire. So the first question is for Eddie. Eddie, you are an award-winning filmmaker who competes regularly in the Film Lab 72-hour shootout. His films consistently rank among the top films every year. Can you tell us, from a director's perspective, why do you compete in the shootout anymore? Isn't that just for emerging filmmakers? What do you, as an award-winning established filmmaker, get out of it? Uh, I hope <laughs> I'm still emerging. I <laughs> no, I, I like it. I, I actually love it. I, I, um, um, I've been doing it for nine years at least. Nine, ten years maybe. Um, when I first did it, I remember my first film, uh, I, I made this like really, really crazy like story where I was like, sneaking shots in like coals and I went to like you know some gardening place and you know just it was people yelling at each other and everybody was like are you okay what's going on and I was like hiding the camera and stuff like that <laughs> and, uh, yeah I didn't know what I, was, what I was doing but I made you know it was a fun film and, you know and um, uh, but since I think what really was sort of I used it for in the beginning was just a really just a, as an exercise of uh, you know just making films and if anything it was like the one thing I could do once a year which was you know just dedicating one weekend to making a film uh, and then I think it was probably around 210 maybe when I you know really uh, started understanding um, story better and characters better and understanding that the, you know the stories were more you know character driven you know instead of plot driven that I really kind of found, started to find my voice and then I started to um, utilize the, the, the shootout as a, as a mechanism to sort of um, work on specific scenes or, or parts of the story that um, would apply to anything, you know, the bigger thing I was working on. So uh, I, I find it to be a, like an, a great, great, great way for, you know, to exercise those things. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for being here. Awesome. <laughs> um, Patrick, question for you. Um, your, your films, um, people describe them as very deep and emotionally wrought when they emailed us. Um, and those films required you to pull a very nuanced and challenging performance from your actors, particularly people who are very focused on the fact you had children, you had small children in your films doing some very difficult scenes um, that required a lot. And people asked, what insights would you have for the directors here with us today who are seeking to achieve something similar with the actors in their films? That's a good question. Um, I guess when it comes to, to child actors, um, a lot of people ask because both my films are about child actors, you know, is there a special way to work with them? And, and I generally say no. I think that foremost for child actors is that they need to feel safe. Um, and I think that the same could be said for adult actors, but it may be just kind of much more key to, to the right atmosphere for a child actor. And then from there, it depends on the material. Um, I think the reason the child actors did so well is my two films have been family dramas, and children are really keen observers of um, a lot of unspoken things 
in homes, and but that are but they feel them deeply, and so I found that I I've had to say very little um, to to help them along in that understanding, and then so then it's just a matter of making sure that they feel free enough, comfortable enough to express themselves uh, on the set. I think that there's something else too in that, you know, I. I love the situations these uh, performances appear in. And I think sometimes the situations are underappreciated. You know, just the basic setup coming into a scene. And there's a sense that in a performance, it comes from the actor. But I think a lot of times, these really wonderful actors move through a situation. And that is where very delicate things can come out, is when they realize that there's not this pressure, that it must all emanate from me. It's, um, you know, the drama is in these interstitial spaces between us. Um, and I think that a lot of it comes from there. There's something about that room um, that, that gives birth to these really nice full performances. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Aaron, this one is for you. Oh. Um, you have one of the most widely read blogs on diversity and casting. It's called Fairy Princess Diaries. Yes. If you guys haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. It's very thought-provoking. Um, from a director's perspective, uh -huh. especially theatrically, can you comment a little on some of the recent controversies about diversity in casting, such as some of the whitewashing we're seeing right now that's giving a lot of Oh, advice? okay. That's why I was <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I do, I, I write this blog. It's called Fairy Princess Diaries. I have sunk a lot of battleships uh, in terms of in terms of theater companies. I know that some of them have a list like the, like a file this big on some of the stuff I've written in terms of trying to change representation. Um, there is a overwhelming. There was a study that came out. I, I was at a panel the other night, and uh, there was a study that came out. And Asian Americans are the least likely to be represented in any medium, even when. Um, non-traditional casting is employed. So you can look at something, so let's look at something that's like amazingly well diversely cast. So let's look at Hamilton. Now, I'm not trying to take down Hamilton, I think it's amazing, but out of that cast, right, the majority of the cast is Latino and African American. There is one mixed race Asian American, she's the lead Philippa Sue. she plays um, Elizabeth Schuyler, um, and there's one Filipino dancer. That's kind of, the prime example of diversity in casting as it plays out today in entertainment. We are not the majority because we are continually faced with situations like Ghost in the Shell where they will borrow from us, but as I like to call it, the yellow elevator that's, that's gathering all the creative stops before it comes to casting, and that's actually a huge issue. So you have things like Tilda Swinton being cast as an ancient thousand-year-old Tibetan. It was a man, but now it's a woman. That's good. That's a, that's a positive step. But now it's she. Tilda Swinton is, of course, uh, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish. Um, so it would be very difficult to buy her as an ancient Tibetan. And so then what happened was Marvel tried to explain themselves. Oh no, she's not Tibetan anymore. She's Celtic. Well, I'm half Irish. So Celtic actually for me is something I know a lot about. And one of the things I wrote about was, well, if she's Celtic, you got it doubly wrong on both sides because the hair is wrong, the armbands are wrong, There's the, the, everything about it is wrong. What happens when people erase Asian people from uh, situations where they should be is that we get this general malaise in America of how to recognize and deal with Asian representation. People look at us and they say, oh, well, why are you being so sensitive? Or why are you complaining? That's because we've been taken so far out of the conversation that our feelings and input are actually seen as an impediment to people's enjoyment. They don't look at it like, oh, they have a valid point. They look at it like, oh, why are they bothering us? We really love this, this entertainment series. You know, we really love this Marvel, I've, I grew up on Doctor Strange, and why are you getting in the way of my enjoyment of it? That's the issue. The issue is we've so long been erased, South Asian and East Asian, that our feelings and our input don't matter. To, you know, And they don't matter in many ways because a lot of Asian Americans have grown up in the diaspora. So I've, how many people here grew up in a largely um, white community? 
Right, me too. Yeah, I was, and, and I'm not even, as most Asians would say, you're not that Asian. So, um, you know, I grew up with like a kind of altered sense of what even being Asian American would have been because when I would go to places where people were largely, you know, 100% Asian background, they would go, well, you're not Asian. Mm -hmm. So like, you don't count. So we have so many different groups and we are all kind of interfighting with each other about who is Asian enough, who's not Asian, and we don't have a collective voice. Like one of the great things that we could learn from other communities is like, for example, the black community or the Hispanic community, and when it comes to issues of representation, they all come together. Yes, there's like Mexican and Chilean and all that kind of stuff, but when it comes to a certain point, they get together and they speak as a collective group and their collective group is very powerful because it has a lot of money behind it. Same with um, black Americans have had a long tradition of activism in this country and indeed the last casting controversy about Hamilton was actually started by an African American man who was a civil rights attorney and he just objected to language. So we have a long way to go in America. Um, the only thing that will continue to um, affect change in this area is for all of you who did grow up in a largely white community you have a lot of white friends and you have to even though they don't like to hear it and they absolutely do not like to hear it it is really annoying to them if you become the person that's like oh and there are no asians in that oh and there are no asians in that but you have to build kind of a collective understanding amongst your peers and your friends and your fellow artists that this is actually a problem and it's not about like, hey, I want to take something away from you. It's, hey, I want us to all come together and build together. Mm -hmm. I want to be seen just as you want to be seen. I want to turn on the television, and I don't want Tuesday night to be the only night Asian Americans mm -hmm. are on television, mm -hmm. you know, in one show. I don't want to turn on Friday and get like 30 minutes of Dr. Ken, and that's it. I want there to be a wide panoply of Asian representation, and one of the reasons is because when we have shows like, for example, like Miss Saigon, people have mixed feelings about Miss Saigon. I have talked to Leia Salong about it. She and I are on the same page. Um, the, I don't have an objection to Miss Saigon because prostitutes are a reality. They're a reality in musical theater. Uh, they're in every show. So to me, if you're going to protest something like Miss Saigon, you have to do it like, are you pro what are you protesting exactly? Are you protesting prostitution? Are you protesting like women's roles or portrayals? Or you can't just blanket say, I'm only protesting Miss Saigon because there are Asians in it and I don't want Asian prostitutes. The reason this becomes a hot blood issue is because we don't have the wide range of representation. And so when you see only this version of Asian Americans performing, even though the prostitutes are literally 15 minutes in the entire show, literally, I'm not even joking. When the collective response is Asian American women in theater and film are prostitutes, that's the trickle down that everybody is protesting. That's where the anger comes in. You're not showing them as doctors. You're not showing them as lawyers. You're not showing them as anything other than fantasy women. And that's the issue. That's where anger comes from. That's why the whitewashing has gotten to what I like to hope is the tipping point now in America and in and in kind of like the conscious like even the variety is writing about it Hollywood reporter is writing about it people are noticing now to an extent that they didn't notice before and I think one of the reasons is because of bloggers is because of you know maybe fairy princess diaries and nerds of color and Jeff Yang writing for the Wall Street Journal and all these journalists that grew up in America that are tired of not seeing themselves and now have children and don't want their children to grow up in the same way, we've all had it. Like we don't we don't want to see it anymore. And so you're gonna see a large amount of groundswell of uprising for Asian Americans. And some people will get really angry and will be very loud and some people will do their work a different way. But the way everybody here can help is when you write a film, you don't have to write, this is an Asian character. You write the film, and then you cast it. Don't write an Asian character. Already, you limit, and you twist, and you don't write a black character. Don't write a, you know, a German character, unless it's like, you know, about Nazi Germany. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> write characters, write real people, and then open up your eyes when it comes to casting. 
open the door and say, when, you, when the agent calls and says, what do you want to see? You say, I want to see everything. I want to see everything. Show me people I haven't seen before. Show me great parent directors. Show me people of color. Show me people with disabilities. Show me a wide range of things because that's what America looks like. Go downstairs and open your door. It's New York City. <laughs> Go downstairs and open your door and look around and say, I could cast my movie with the first five people I see walking around the street. What do they look like? And that's a good litmus test for how any director should start looking at theater and film. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's my take on it. So yeah, and casting firstly. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> like, no, 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 that's not. Um, so yeah, you you were you uh, described yourself as an, a, a new, pretty new director. You've done um, two films. You did one for the shootout, which was a promo film, and then you did one for the film Labs production arm. We saw the trailer here. Um, the second one you did, the one we just saw the trailer for, you were under a pretty severe time crunch. I think you shot the whole thing in four days. Seven days. Seven days. <laughs> you shot the whole thing in seven days. You dealt with a cast of over 20 people. You had a script that spanned from the 1940s to present day and took place on two different continents. So for any director, that would be fairly challenging. Um, but as a first time filmmaker, were there a unique set of challenges or partic one particular challenge that really taught you a lesson that you think <coughs> would be useful for the directors tuning in with us today? Uh, that's a good question and hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, be perfectionist in the input because um, it's there's a lot of things to prepare when it's 42 scenes and it's only seven days. There's a lot of different locations. There's a lot of actors, but at the same time, when you prepare for that for the input, you know that there's there's a things that you can't prepare. You can there's a things that like car crash down in the middle of the scene, in, like middle of the shooting. That's things that you can control, but there are the things that you can definitely control. Like how can you minimize the travel time? How can you minimize the things that, like how can you make um, shooting the scene, several scenes at the same, in terms of like produ production schedule, how can you do it? So I would say um, prepare as much as possible. Um, do your best and um, for the input, and if things are not working out, if the input is not good, output cannot be good. So that's the, my answer. Great. Mm -hmm. So then these are some of the ones that just came in online. Um, this is a question for everyone. What is one unique trait or skill that you have <laughs> that makes you a good director? <laughs> <laughs> They're very humble. <laughs> I can go. I, I can go because I've, I've been directing this last year. Um, I'm really demanding, and I like rehearsal. Um, I tend to like right now. I'm teaching at Adelphi University, and I'm working with a lot of younger students. And the requirements that they have are, um, or the way they work is not always the way I was taught to work. And so what I'm doing with them is I'm making them do it over and over and over until I get there. And um, for me, it's trying to communicate. What I always break down is don't sing, tell me a story. I don't want to hear an explanation. I want to see it happen. And that's, you know, that's a theatrical way of, of describing it. I do work a lot in musical theater, so you know, I do have to break it down like that. But for me, um, I don't think any director should be afraid of rehearsal. And I think it's okay to say that wasn't what I want. Because a lot of times, you know, especially if you're a starting filmmaker, you can get maybe some actors that are more experienced than perhaps, like they've done 10 films and this is your first. And so they'll, they do, actors are, I'm an actor so I can say it, actors are bullies, you know, sometimes they're like, they don't want to do it again, they're <laughs> tired, they already did it, they thought the take was great. And it's okay for you to, you know, you don't have to yell and scream, but it's okay for you to say, no, we're gonna go again. Back to one, thank you. And just be confident in your own vision. I've worked with a lot of directors, I represented directors for years, and the one thing that separated the really great directors from the people who did okay was a clear point of view. 
as to what was, because nobody knows what's going on in the camera except you and the TV. And that would be, that would be just to have strength in your vision and know it's okay to say, we didn't get it. That's it. <laughs> Um, so I agree, rehearsal is very, very important. Um, I think pre-production process is, is really, really crucial. Um, I think that also incorporates you know, rehearsals and everything else. Yeah. Um, you know, if it, I mean, it really depends what you're talking about, if it's a film or, or if it's the 72 hour you know, thing, it's, it's definitely oh, knowing. Oh, that's harder, yeah. Yeah, definitely knowing what you have to work with ahead of time. Um, my, my biggest problem was always like, I never knew if I could actually do it. So unfortunately, as you know, I would always be like the only person doing it, and I'd have to like beg somebody to do a camera. Um, so a lot of my 72-hour things don't have very much dialogue in it, just because you know it's it's, it's a lot to, to deal with. So, um, but pre-production in that sense, like knowing what you have available to you, what props you have, uh, you know, those kinds of things, you can kind of put together a story. The last one I did, I was invited to a party on Saturday night, and the shootout was like a Friday night. And you know, of course, the cameraman was my, one of my closest friends, and he was also invited to the party too. So I put the story in the party. I asked the people who were in the throwing the party, "It's like, do you guys mind if we walk around the camera and kind of like, you know, <laughs> shoot this story, or whatever?" And they're like, "Yeah, sure, no problem. We'll be drinking. We'll be fine." And you know, six hours, seven hours later, in the thing, they're like, "Are you finished shooting yet?" You know? <laughs> it's just kind of like, you know, these things. And but it worked out great. And. Um, uh, you know, so that was that was really cool. Um, but also, I think as a director with your actors, I'm actually a bit. Uh, well, no, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm a bit different, but no, and, every director is different. Yeah, I, I, I was different. taught as a, a, a director is to you know, well, I shouldn't say that. I was taught not to, never to. You know, actors are very very sensitive creatures, you know. And um, for me, it's it's most important to try to play as much as possible. I love playing because I think. It is absolutely impossible as, you know, whether you're, when you're writing the script, you have a certain vision. If you're directing the script, you have a different vision. When you're cutting it, it's another vision and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I also believe that sap, uh, music adds a different dimension as well. But, you know, for me also, I think the actor's input is extremely paramount as well. I mean, there are things that hap happy accidents always come about, you know, like uh, there's so many scenes in films that you know, happen just from a stupid discussion when you know, you know, when you're not shooting something, and, and those things get put into films, uh, you know, and they're never written in. Uh, those are happy accidents, and I think um, by allowing uh, uh, your actors to play and then shaping and molding basically is to get to what yeah. you what you want where you want, um, uh, you know, is, is really really important. So for me, you know, that also is a, is a huge thing. Now, naturally, you have a schedule. You should have a schedule and. Uh, know how much you can afford to play with and, and so forth and, and then you know it's your job as a director to sort of shape the uh, the actor you know to you know lead that actor in that direction to develop that character um, so uh, you know and I, you always hear sometimes sometimes the best directors are the ones that where the actors don't even notice that they're being, they're being directed uh, you know and and you're empowering them and I think that's very very important to and crucial to make your story uh, really come to life because that's you're, you're depending on them as well so